All present and accounted for, huh? We're here with former NASA astronaut Ed Gibson to talk about Skylab, the first United Space Station which was launched by NASA in 1973 and was occupied for 24 weeks until February of the following year. Dr. Gibson was the last person on board Skylab. The spacecraft was purposely crash-landed in Western Australia in 1979. Dr. Gibson, it is a pleasure speaking with you today. Okay, to Jerry, Ed and Bill. We have been watching and listening with admiration and with awe as you have settled down to a routine of life in space. I think I would like to start by asking what was life like during the three months you were on board of Skylab? Uh, very busy. Okay. I didn't have time to actually enjoy space, but uh, ground control kept us marching full bore all the time. Can you tell us a little bit like of the day-to-day -day experience uh, on Skylab? Well, let's see how you wake up in the morning and you're quite, not quite too sure where you are, but then you try to get out of your bed, which is uh, really a bunch of straps on the wall that hold you down. And you do that and you start floating away. And so now you understand where you are. Uh, you get up and uh, first thing you do is you got to collect some samples, uh, urine samples, uh, which are brought back. We had a mineral balance experiment. So uh, they measured the... Uh, or controlled the six minerals that came into us and they could kept that plus or minus 10% every day. And then they, they uh, wanted to measure what came out of us. So we had collected our urine and uh, that was put into little tubes and frozen, which we called urine sickles. And, uh, the, uh, uh, and, and the feces of vacuum dried and all brought back so they could see what's happening. And the net result was the only thing we lost was a um, continuous, uh, amount of calcium, which is obviously from our bones, came back to normal soon as we got back. But had we, I, I, I don't know if I was up there for four or five years, what it would be like. You know, the guys who have been up there for one year, they lost the same, they lost calcium, but when they came back, they didn't, um, uh, apparently there was no danger of them breaking bones when they put weight on their skeletal structure. So, um, but that's what we got to we had we're trying to understand for a real long duration space flight what do we what do we have to do and uh, the trouble is if you start trying to take more calcium by by mouth uh eventually you'll you'll get kidney stones so um that's not a good solution so we've got to we still have to better understand that one if someone wants to stay up there for five years ten years whatever that is absolutely fascinating and it shows how much uh, Skylab was important uh, in our um, understanding uh, of uh, what it's like to be a human in space. Yeah, it, it was. People designed that very well and we were glad to be part of it. I would say scientifically, uh, Skylab wasn't just about astronautics. So you also uh, did the observation of the Earth, uh, um, observation of a comet, uh, um, and even solar observation. Can you tell us a little bit more about the scientific mission of Skylab 4? Mankind is gaining fundamental knowledge each day as a result of your activities, your observations of the Sun, the Earth, and the comet Kotek, and from your reports of your own adaptation to the space environment. Well, the other uh, the, the scientific uh, side of it, um, we had um, Earth observations, solar observations, and the medical experiments, which you just briefly touched on. The um, astronomy and looking at or looking back at the Earth was really interesting too, because when you're up there, you look down and it's like being in an airplane, um, and the rate at which you're going is, at, from an angle standpoint, is about the same as if you're in an airplane. Of course, we were going much faster physically, but we were much higher. So the angle change is about the same, and you you don't see just part of a city; you see half a continent at a time. And after staring at all that day after day, you get to know the Earth like the back of your hand, which was really an enjoyable thing because you really get a good picture of what our what all the continents are like and what is humanity is confined to down here. That was very good. Uh, we had uh, some sites that we went over which were identified previously. And we took a lot of data on it. And then the people on the ground had airplanes and ships and everything else to collect data down there. So then you can correlate the data and just see what's the, what you're really seeing in space and how realistic is it. Uh, let's see, solar, solar observations. Um, that was my specialty because I, uh, 
I had learned to um, learn a little bit about solar physics. I wrote a textbook in it called The Quiet Sun. And so I was really happy to be up there and do that. And solar physics is interesting. Um, most of the time, the sun is just a big round yellow ball and just sitting there staring at you. But every now and then, um, when you, you get some magnetic field reconfigurations, energy is cut loose. And if it's a big configuration, they call it a flare. A lot of radiation is thrown off. And so with our, with our equipment, we had a number of different telescopes and collecting devices. Some were just looked at the whole sun, so we can and the our region around it called the corona. And we could watch that uh, continuously, unlike down here where you have to travel to a mountaintop every three or four years just to get a glimpse of it. But we could see it anytime we were in sunlight. Um, so we really got spoiled with that. And then we looked at various points on the surface um, in um, fault zones, we call them, or, or uh, magnetic zones up there, you, you could see uh, radiation uh, coming out in little spurts when you started getting close to a flare. It reminded me of looking at a pot of water and it starts to boil. Well, the sun was like analogous to that. Every once in a while, it start to erupt. And, and if you were uh, trained where to look and had the equipment ready to go, you could get uh, a, a flare from birth to, to the end. And that's one thing we uh, were really trying to do is to get a understanding of how a flare occurs. So we wanted to get it right from the very beginning. And towards the end of the flight, I was able to do that, but it was only, only because I had uh, three or four orbits to just sit there and look at the sun. And then when the when it started to to get um, you know the uh, amount of energy started to come off in this, in various points and bright points and then eventually the whole thing exploded at least the area where you were looking so that that did happen um, now unfortunately we had only w uh, one instrument up there that recorded data electronically the rest was by film it was the old days and of course the film was limited. And when you try to get a flare, you have to get the, the resolution has to be good in a time sense. So you, uh, you have to burn a lot of film. So you're very careful. You don't, you don't go into that mode unless you really suspect you're going to get something good. So, um, and, and, and we did, and it worked well. And um, the only problem was when we got back, we thought we had gotten uh, some really good data for them, but it was as good as we could get and as good as a Skylab could provide. But, they just didn't have the, the uh, spatial resolution to understand the details of the birth of a flare. So we're going to have to have Skylab 2 up there and do this all over again. To be honest, uh, uh, over 40 years after, uh, it's, we're still struggling to understand the sun. So I think uh, what you've been able to do has uh, already pushed the envelope for how much we understand solar physics. Um, as a personal curiosity, what was it like to go on a spacewalk? I did three, and uh, that was um, that was, I really got to enjoy them. It was it was a little different uh, when you're up there um, in Skylab. You might be floating around, but you always have a wall around you, so you know you're contained. When you finally put on your your suit and open the hatch, then you look out and. There's the ground 270 miles down and nothing between you and the ground. And you float out and you, you say, well, I wonder if that Newton guy was really wrong part of the time. <laughs> <laughs> so they, it worked pretty well, but uh, it, was, um, it was very good. That's the, the ultimate freedom. Uh, you're out there, just you and, the, you and the universe. Of course, you got an umbilical and so forth, but um, if you really want to feel, feel free, that's, that's the way to do it. And we had a lot of work to do. So um, we, we had to get busy doing that. The uh, one thing you have to have up there, if you're going to do anything outside, do any work anywhere, is a way to stabilize yourself. So the workstations that we had up there had foot restraints. So we just float over and insert our feet and then use our arms and hands to, to get done what we needed to. So that worked real well. But uh, just floating free, especially the first time you go out the hatch, <laughs> you say it is a long way down. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it, was, it was exciting. I wish you, you could have that experience. 
I hope that one day I can experience that too. Um, you um, mentioned it a few times in this interview, but um, can you tell us a little bit more um, if the mission was difficult, if uh, it became taxing? I understand that uh, you had a lot of work to do over those three months. Yes. Yeah, we did. And um, we were the last one to go. So uh, when people on the ground understood that this was the last one to go up, everybody who had a, a wish to have an experiment up, um, got on board. So we were packed and um, then we had Kamika Hutek um, and a whole number of other things that, that really packed our training and then packed our time up there. Uh, now the uh, Bill Pogue, who was uh, um, the pilot on board, he used to fly with the Thunderbirds and you can never make that guy sick on the ground or in, in, in the air, we call them old lady or, you know, we just, we, we had a, uh, an experiment where they tested our resistance to motion sickness. And it was a chair which rotated. And when you made, when you're sitting in the chair, then according to a cadence, you had to make head motions, you know, this way and, um, and back and forth, all three different directions. And Bill would never get sick. Jerry and I were about normal compared to most pilots and most people. Uh, we got stomach unawareness or paleness or sweaty palms, whatever the criteria, which was applicable to a given individual. Bill never could get sick down here on the ground doing that. So we figured that, you know, he, he's going to be the stalwart when we got up there. Well, after we got up there for about uh, an hour and a half or so, Bill said, um, Jerry, I'm not feeling too well. So Jerry Carr, the commander says, well, that's all right. Now get something to eat and that'll make you feel better. So um, Jerry pulled out a can of tomatoes and they passed them over to Bill. So the can of tomatoes were going off the eye across, across my vision. And about uh, um, oh, four or five minutes later, the tomatoes came back this, in this direction without the can. So <laughs> we got, we, he, he got sick. And we just never expected that. And he didn't feel good for about the whole half the half of flight or so. So we we're operating with really two and a half people. So that, that put us under more time pressure. Skylab is history now, and mountains of data are to be argued and published and argued and published again. And you who have given some of your lives and had some of your lives unwillingly taken by her are free to enjoy the sun. Welcome back to Earth. Signed, Houston. You were literally the last person on board. Uh, you closed uh, the hatch uh, and uh, came back uh, down to Earth. And then five years later, um, Skylab was uh, uh, crash landed uh, in Western Australia. How yes. did it feel? It, Skylab was such an important part of your life. So how did it feel seeing it crashing down? Yeah, we didn't know. We had wondered if we would, there would there, uh, there'd be other people up there after us. So we left the door open and um, didn't exclude anything, make, sh make sure everything was open. We didn't know whether it was going to be someone from, from uh, our side, Europeans and, and Americans, or whether it'd be the Russians who went up there. Well, it turned out that nobody went up there. So when it crashed down, the only thing we were, I was very happy about when I knew it was heading to Australia is that it didn't hit anybody or, or cause any real serious damage. So, so it landed in a reasonable place from that standpoint. So when it was all over, we you know, breathed a sigh of relief and said, well, we're glad we had the opportunity. The documentary Searching for Skylab has recently highlighted how brilliant this mission was. But for you personally, what would you like the legacy of Skylab to be? What would you like Skylab to be remembered for? Oh, primarily as a, a precursor to other long range flights and starting us down that road of continuous presence in space. Obviously we got some good data for various scientific elements, but the real thing is that we finally set a milestone that we didn't have on our previous flights, at least on our American side. The Russians had, had more experience than us in that respect. So that was that was it. We just uh, were happy to have a be one of the first.
Thank you. That was a, a great answer. And thank you so much for this interview. It's been an absolute pleasure. Well, thank you for your interest. I really appreciate it. Good luck. Hope it all goes well. Welcome home, Skylab, the world's largest space station, man's longest venture into space, improved understanding of the universe, rediscovery of the planet Earth, accomplishment of major space vehicle repair, man, machine, and spirit in a truly incredible accomplishment.